Good morning and welcome to everyone. Happy Black History Month. This is our first episode for a string of episodes where we will be celebrating Black History Month. Dr. Cheney, good morning to you this morning. Good morning. Mr. John Salati, how are you today? Great Salon, great being here. Good great. to see you. We, we have a very special guest, but before I get into that, the bar is coming up. All of you all who are studying for the bar, it's in a couple of weeks, the last Wednesday and Thursday of February. Here's a little nugget that you would probably more than likely see on the exam. Black History Month, we're talking about certain rights. The rights and liberties protected by the constitution require a showing of state action. A lot of times people miss this lay people miss this and they think that the constitution grants certain rights against private citizens. They don't. The constitution for the most part protects people against the government and the state, not against private citizens. The 13th amendment, remember that, that's the slavery amendment that outlawed slavery and all quote unquote badges and incidents of slavery. But what does that mean, really? Does it mean that it would ban racial discrimination? Is that a badge or an incident of slavery? The courts say, no, it is not. So private citizens, if it were just for the Constitution, may have the right to racially discriminate against you, but they don't. And this is the one reason why. The Commerce Clause. Remember the Commerce Clause. It's one of the most powerful clauses within our Constitution. Under the Commerce Clause, racial, racial discrimination in restaurants, hotels, pretty much anywhere that money is exchanged. Remember the Commerce Clause governs the exchange of money between states. And so the courts say that when stores discriminate against African-Americans or any other class, it impacts interstate commerce. So if you see a question dealing with racial discrimination and what constitutional provision would prevent that, remember it is the commerce clause, all right? Racial discrimination, Black History Month, these things tie together. And that brings me to our special guest, Minister Kwame Rani Vanderhorst is with us today. Let me tell you a little bit about Minister Vanderhorst. He is the co-founder of Prepare Our Youth, which is a nonprofit organization serving children, youth, and families through education and counseling, and is based right here in Washington, D.C. Even though it's based in Washington, I think they brought outside of Washington. We'll talk to him more about that. He's also the founder and president of Seed Planter International, which is dedicated to uniquely for and unapologetically about black men. He's an inspirational speaker, mentor, trainer, author, and publisher. He's written over eight books and he's in the process of writing five more. Welcome Kwame. Ronnie Vanderhorst, how are you doing this morning? I'm thankful. I am thankful to have you here, and we're honored to have you here today to talk to us today about some of the injustices that Black men have experienced over the years. Talk to us. First of all, I would like to ask permission to speak from our elder, Dr. Cheney. You have permission to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Phillip, for this opportunity for me to do the best that I've always done, and that is to plant seeds. In fact, my purpose in life is a seed planter. Let me start with something that Dr. King said. He said, and I quote, I always look forward for something to knock me out of my dogmatic slumber, unquote. 
And that is my hope and objective today as we consider what I have called the souls of black men. Okay. A man named John was once, a, once in the show dog business and he had won many prizes. It helped him to become wealthy, win the envy of his friends and even to help save his master's life on a number of occasions. But as the vicissitudes of capitalism would have it, there came a time where there was no longer money in the show dog business. The situation changed Master John's feelings toward his once prized possession. He could be heard saying he's a lazy, no good for nothing dog. All he wants to do is just lay around and eat my food. I'd wish he'd go away. So filled with hatred and resentment, Master John, by cruel and ingenuous means, drove his dog rabidly mad. As fate would have it, the mad dog attempted to attack its owner, and Master John killed his dog with a single shot from an elephant gun. Because there was a law against shooting dogs, Master John was tried before a jury of his peers. Master John, as represented by his lawyer, pleaded self-defense. It's, it's cut and dried, he said. The dog was mad, and in his madness, he sought to attack his owner. And in self-defense, his owner shot him. His driving the dog mad and thus allegedly having precipitated the dog's attack, as argued by the prosecutor, is irrelevant and immaterial his attorney said. And doesn't a man have a right of self-defense? Besides, he's only a dog prone to a dog's nature, a nature to go mad. Had he not been a dog, he would not have been driven mad in the first place. For, and then his master would not have shot him and the dog would not have tried to attack his master or be a threat to our wives, our elders, and even our fair haired children. But what does it matter anyway with this dog going mad? He's no longer disturbing the peace and posing a threat to law and order. Master John did the world a favor and for that he should be honored and not persecuted, and thus a jury of his peers found him not guilty. Thus, thus begin the strange career of Master John, whose single-minded purpose in life became that of breeding mad dogs and executing them in self-defense. He thereby gained a great reputation an honored status among his neighbors who he protected from mad dogs running loose in the streets. He became an expert at breeding, apprehending and executing mad dogs. His bank account increased for he had uh, established a very lucrative business now. He caged, get this, his mad dogs with not so mad dogs many of whom themselves became mad and in escaping their confounds threatened the peace. Mad dogs were everywhere. The neighbors were in fear and terror and they be became incapable of distinguishing the mad dogs from the not so mad dogs. Mm -hmm. All of the dogs, even the ones who were members of the family who everyone thought was near human like Sambo, the model dog, became a threat and aroused suspicions. Thus, as a preventative measure, the village was lamentably forced to liquidate all dogs, regardless of their social status or mental state. After all, a dog is a dog is a dog. And they even formed a society for the eradication of all dogs everywhere. America drives black men mad and then they execute us. 
What kind of person would murder a 12 year old child, black child on a playground exactly two seconds after getting out of his police car and not get charged? Mm. Rest in peace, Tamir Rice. What kind of persons would kidnap, brutally beat, shoot, and then drown a 14-year-old black male and an all-white jury find these sadistic murderers not guilty? Rest in peace, Emmett Till. What kind of person would stalk and assassinate a 17-year-old teenager walking home with Skittles and iced tea in his hands? and get acquitted. Rest in peace, Trayvon Martin. What kind of person would murder an unarmed 18 year old male and leave his bloody body in the street for four hours and the police officer not get charged? Rest in peace, Michael Brown. And what kind of person would put their knee on the neck of a man for nine minutes and 29 seconds and extinguish his life and his co-officers did nothing to stop. Rest in peace, George Floyd. And I hope that the listeners can be knocked out of their dogmatic slumber as we see what is going on in the black village and around this country that is happening to black males and black women, but I'm speaking particularly about black males today, the souls of black males. But get this what Mel Reeves said. He said, many of us have fallen into the racially rigged trap that makes middle-class blacks less inclined to reach out or uh, uh, to our less, unfor less fortunate brothers who catch some of the same hell that we do, but have less resources, both psychological and material to fight back and resist their demonization. And history teaches us that you can ignore people who you demonize. And sometimes you can kill them or allow them to be killed because clearly they deserve their fate. Even the American prison industrial complex eats black men alive. Joseph Esky said that you can tell the degree of a society simply by looking at its prisons. But our, our, our eminent Dr. Naeem Akbar concisely critiques this travesty, travesty. He says this, the majority, the vast majority of creative black minds in America who are males are locked up in prison during the most productive years of their lives, when most Euro-American males are present in universities, colleges, and training institutes, gaining the skills that are necessary to ensure that they run the world the way they have been running the world. While our future leaders, future educators, future advocates can be found in the jails of America, locked away, unable to think under the watchful eye of sick minds who would rather see them dead than learning. I posit to you today that this country has harvested a generation of black males in trauma. In trauma. But my recently deceased friend and elder, Dr. Richard Williams, who entitled one of his books, They Stole It, But We Must 
take it back. They stole it, but we must return it. This is what we must do. And this is what your organization is doing. This is what your emphasis is about. The restoration of black people, the restoration of those who suffer from inequity and injustice. And, and I applaud you. So what is trauma? Dr. Joy DeGru in her seminal book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome says this, I quote, trauma is an injury caused by an outside force, usually violent. It is also an event or an experience. We can experience this injury physically, emotionally, psychologically, and even spiritually. Traumas can upset our equilibrium and sense of well being. She continues if one traumatic event can result in distorted attitudes, dysfunctional behaviors, and unwanted consequences, this pattern is magnified exponentially when a person repeatedly experiences severe trauma. And it is much worse when these traumas are caused by human beings. And that's why I believe that it is quintessential for us to, to start with and focus on our young black males, our children and youth. These black males on the preventative side of it. Dr. Francis Cress Wellesley our ancestor now, but a very venerable and noted child psychiatrist who was based here in Washington, DC. In fact, um, our organization, Prepare Our Youth, referred a number of children to her. She was just five minutes away from our office. But she said something very important. She said, our children are our most valuable possession and children are the future of any people. I'm quoting her from memory. Any meaningful discussion in the future of black people must be predicated upon that people's maximal development of its children. And then she asked four questions. Question number one, will black children, let's say black males, be maximally developed? Question number two, if so, who will be ultimately responsible for the maximal development of black males? Question number three, if they are not to be maximally developed, what do we think will happen to that mass of human beings? And then question number four, are white people in any way looking to black people for the maximal development of white children? She concludes by saying that any system that is meant to oppress will not maximally develop black children at all. And so I have a, 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 just a few quick solutions to consider. The first uh, comes from Elder Neely Fuller, who was Dr. Francis, Fres Francis uh, uh, Francis Chris Welsing's mentor. He lives over in Southwest. In fact, my brother Steve and I went over to see him one day and to get some books from him. And he said, come on in. He lives in a senior apartment. And we sat there three hours just transfixed as he sold into us and just gave us information. But Dr. I mean, Elder Neely Fuller talks about the nine areas of people activity. We probably know them as institutions. There is economics, education, entertainment, law, media, politics, religion, sex, which is family, and war. And nine, all these nine areas of people activity have historically, and many of them continue to be functionaries of white supremacy. It was against the law 
to go to the same schools, to eat in the same restaurants and so forth. All of these were functionaries. In fact, we see the, 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 uh, the functionary of education that is going on in this country. Dr. John Henry Clark, our eminent ancestor and historian said, uh, quote, that Europeans not only colonized lands and people, they also colonized information. So we see in Texas, they've taken the word slave out of their new history books and they call them indentured servants. We see the war on critical race theory, which was not taught in elementary and, and high schools and so forth. It was actually started by lawyers to deal with the injustices that was going on and the inequities that was going on. But we see the war against critical race theory. We see legislations coming out of different states. One of my read just two weeks ago that um, a state is proposing not to have anything taught in the public schools that will, I quote, make white students feel bad, unquote. And so we see the functionaries of these nine uh, areas of institution that are contradictory and, and inequitable, especially as it pertains to white males. And so I believe that one of the things that is quintessential that we must do in the Black village is that we must decolonize Black parenting. In fact, my organization, Prepare Our Youth, at the end of this month, I am starting a Zoom um, group called The Parent Group. I'll, I'll make sure, um, Attorney Philip, I get you more information on The Parent Group that I'm starting, that it'll be a Zoom. And whoever wants to be a part of that, on that, in this teaching discussion format, we're going to deal with Black parenting. We have to decolonize that. We have to deconstruct many of the things that actually go on that are deleterious to the thought processes and the lives even of our own black children. We need to have a stabilizing uh, uh, principle philosophy for parenting. My definition of parenting is parenting is sowing. The whole construct is a seed basically. And understanding natural principles is a prelude to understanding realities. When we study nature, when we study the seed, we can see how to grow children, which then means that we must have a right attitude and a right atmosphere in which our children must grow. I believe that our Black males need to go through a rites of passage, a structured uh, transition from boyhood to manhood program. We need rites of passage. I believe that every parent needs a work plan for each individual child. We just can't bribe brush <clears throat> our children. We need a work plan for each one of our children, the goals and then the objectives that we will use to reach those particular goals. What is our physical goal for our children? What is our mental, emotional health goal for our children? What are our educational goals? What are our community service goals for our children? It must be a balanced work plan for our children. Next to last, we need man school. I do a man school for teenagers, 13 to 17. And I also have a man school for brothers who are 18 and above. I've even uh, um, designed and developed a, a grassroots uh, based intervention called Homeboy. The acronym is Helping Our Males Excel While Breaking Our Yokes. It's a 12 session group level intervention. You see, I believe that we just can't have discussions alone, we need interventions for black males that prove that they can change knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, and so forth. And the last thing I will say is 
our black males need mentors. However, as I am dealing with a lot of mothers who are parenting sons alone, who don't have mentors for their sons, I have um, encouraged them to use books as mentors. A couple books that I've written for youth, one called Growing and Flowing, How to Grow Up Straight in a Crooked World is a mentor for black youth, where we have strong black women and men who mentor them through their books. The autobiography of Malcolm X, the PACT, P-A-C-T of these three doctors out of um, Newark, New Jersey, who made a pact when they were in junior high school that they all were gonna be doctors and all of the things they went through, but they accomplished their goal. Young people, young brothers need to read books as their mentors also. True. Because trauma has impacted the souls of black men. And so we must catch them on the front end. So I'll start right there. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to plant some seeds. Thank you. Thank you for planting the seeds. Now, now, I have a few questions before I turn it over to Dr. Cheney. Now, all of what you had mentioned, and I love the way that you opened with the dog scenario, but for our listeners, some who have no idea of the history of what went on in this country, what do you think is at the foundation of this injustice that's directed towards black men? What's at the foundation? Where did it all come from? Truth is not against people. Truth is against error, false systems, false constructs, injustice, inequity. And so there are a lot of people who think that we are playing the victim card. No, we are playing the truth telling card. Their history in this country is littered with facts of what has happened to black males. I mean, I was talking to a group, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing, I have a group on Friday evenings, a group of brothers out of Montreal, Canada. And I was saying, why do you think castration was so prominent? It was a form of genocide. Why do you think lynching was so prominent in this country? Because if you get, if you take out both heads, mm -hmm, then you can destroy the progeny of a black man. And so basically, history is littered. What happens is there is a serious state of denial that's going on. And, 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 and then there's so much disinformation that a lie believed becomes truth to a person and they try to do all they can to prove the lie true. And so therefore, uh, uh, there are just certain forces, as Elder Neely Fuller, Fuller, uh, Fuller said, that out of these institutions, they are functionaries of white supremacy. And that means domination. That means control by any means necessary. Especially, last thing on that answer is, um, Joseph Boskin, a historian, a white historian, did serious research on the character called Sambo. And he was created to be a person of derision, to be able to be laughed at by whites so that he would not appear to be a potential warrior or a potential competitor. So Sambo was created and we still see the buffoonery that some of our brothers are paid to continue on with in media. So therefore the, the disinformation, the fear, the denial 
And finally this, the anti-human perspective. See, I have brothers and sisters now who are not even calling it racism anymore. They're drilling deeper than that. They are now calling them anti-human. Mm. Certain individuals, certain acts, anti-human, where we are getting to the core of our whole existence as individuals, as a people, as a society, as a humanity. Yeah. Now, now something just recently happened. Uh, I want to get your take on it. February the 1st, a uh, coach, African-American coach by the name of Brian Flores, filed a lawsuit against the NFL. And I want, I want to quote some of that. I have his lawsuit here. And I want to ask you, um, let me just share my screen so I could share it with the audience. He's a black NFL coach and he filed a class action lawsuit, meaning that he's going to include other people other than he's opening the door so other people can join his lawsuit. But the attorney starts off very something like we do, John. Sorry, I effed this up. I double checked and misread the text. I think they are naming Brian the ball. I'm sorry about that, BB. Bill Belichick, and this is the attorney, informing plaintiff Brian Flores three days before his interview with the New York Giants that Brian DeBowell had already been selected. This, so a little history, um, Brian Flores, an African-American coach, he was fired from the Miami Dolphins. He was given an interview for the New York Giants, but little did he know that that job was already given to a white male as the head coach. So he interviewed for a job that had already been taken. And then the attorney quotes Dr. King, morals cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. The law cannot make an employer love me, but it can keep him from refusing to hire me because of the color of my skin. And the attorney in this lawsuit goes on to compare the NFL to a slave plantation. He, he says that the NFL are players who bring the owners who are white money. And that's what happened with plantation. What you talked about today with the souls of black men and the injustice, does it rise to the level of professional NFL players and coaches? Or is it only for minorities or African-American men who are poor? Is there, is there a difference? No, there's not a difference. It touches all areas of people activity, as Elder Nilly Fuller said. Now, basically we already know and have been knowing that professional sports is a sophisticated form of enslavement. Anytime you can buy, sell, or trade an individual, you are already into the plantation mentality. Mm. But what I will say is that I applaud Brian Flores for something different than what the media is purporting. And even with many of the conversations. You see, in our lives, there is or can be a career, but there is definitely a call on our lives. You see, it's like when I teach young people the power of purpose. Everything, the plant, animal, and human have purpose. Anything that does not fulfill its purpose is useless. And so therefore, all of us, regardless of who we are, have a call on our life. There are people who may focus on their career and not ever know what the call on their life is. You see, our career to a great extent is for our livelihood. The call or purpose on our life is for human good. So we all have a call because all of nature is interdependent. And so is the human family. What I am, am seeing is Brian Flores may be unintentionally moving from career, 
not to just trash him because he still wants to coach professionally, but I'm seeing this, this movement into a call on his life. This thing is bigger than him. And it probably may bar him from ever coaching again, like when Colin Kaepernick uh, 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 discovered the call on his life and took a knee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what he is doing is coming into line with black men who discovered their call. I made a post on Facebook um, a couple of weeks ago. I said that in 2022, we will never reach the pro productivity that we should unless we befriend risk. <laughs> so now Kirk Flood, who was the one that blew this open, will never go into the Hall of Fame when he did that whole thing of player negotiation and so forth. Kirk Flood has better Hall of Fame numbers than most of the guys who are in there right now. So he's coming into line with Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. He's coming into line with a lot of different brothers who stood up Tommy Smith and Johnny Carlos at the Mexico Olympics. And so I applaud him for that, that he is now moving, maybe unintentionally, but it will become intentional if he never gets hired again. So kudos to the brother for coming into the call. And that's what I want black men to understand. You got a call on your life. You have a purpose for your life. Dr. Miles Monroe said this, and this is what I believe for black males. Okay. Our greatest challenge is not drugs, illicit uh, 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 sexual affairs or, uh, or whatever else like that. It's not gangs. The number one challenge for black males is unknown purpose. And Dr. Miles Monroe said, and I'm quoting, when purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. Mm. Unquote. Mm. And so we have to we have to rear these young brothers to identify the purpose, the call on their lives. And I told two boys just yesterday, because Saturday morning, nine o'clock, I, I, I have a session with the fifth grader. At 10 o'clock, I have a session with two brothers who live in Jamaica. At 11.30, I have a session with two black teenage males that live here in Maryland every Saturday. But I told them that everything that you are to be is already inside of you. Mm. I said, in that seed, <clears throat> the whole apple tree. My responsibility is to help get this out, help you to grow, to create the atmosphere for you to grow into your purpose. And once you discover your purpose for your life, black brothers, you will never ever say these two words again, I'm bored, because you will be living on purpose and fine tuning that purpose and working on that purpose. That's, That's awesome. what we've got to do. That's awesome. And we appreciate that passion. Dr. Cheney, I'm gonna get you in here. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Where do I start? <laughs> okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about W. E. Du Bois's book, The Soul of Black Folk. Yes. Something I know that you know about, maybe the readers and the viewers may not necessarily know about. W. E. Du Bois told all who would listen, read, that the problem of the 20th century, as you know, is the problem of the what? Color line. Yes. <clears throat> w. E. Du Bois came up with a lot of concepts that resulted from his notion of the race problem. Double consciousness, mm -hmm. the tunis, and the veil, yeah. to name a few. And we can go into that. <clears throat> w. E. Du Bois' book, The Soul of Black Folk, and your topic, the soul of black men connect. We agree with that. 
W. E. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington are in the book and they have opposing views. Both are seeking to influence. In your examination of today's topic, do you think black men are divided into two separate tiers? One advancing through the white collar route and the other joining the blue collar route? The question I asked you, my number one question. I have two more. Wow, um, interesting. I think that we as black males and black people operate on all tiers. I believe that there are some tiers that are more prominent than others. Where Dr. Uh, Dubois talks about the talented 10th mm -hmm. and so forth. And I believe that they get more attention even with the points of departure that Washington and Dubois had that that gets the majority of the discussion. And I really think that it doesn't do service to the totality of what all that our people do. Here is where I balance it out. I believe that black males need to be able to use their hands and their head. I believe that we need to balance out ourselves, not simply just intellectually, but also vocationally. Because we are in a society, as we know the adage, um, last hired, first fired. What do we have to fall back on? There are PhDs who are out of work at this particular time and, and living in wilderness wildernesses of frustration and futility who may have not learned something vocationally with their hands. And so I'm actually bringing them two together. And I believe that in the inexorable march of time, I do believe that um, Du Bois and Washington would have came closer together like a mountain, Malcolm and Martin did in many of their views that they started out with. But as time went on, they began to gain more understanding and reason and so forth. So I believe that that balance is important instead of juxtaposing it as one contrary to the other. Okay. Are the concept tunus, double consciousness that Du Bois talks about, Black men are looking through, looking at themselves through the lens or the eyes of someone else. The Tunis, an American and a black man, I don't think he says that, but right. I'm adding that. Negro, he says a Negro. Negro and a black man. Mm -hmm. Two souls in one African, well, I said African-American's body, but I think he says one dark body. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking, do you think that's changed? The whole notion of this, we're no longer doing this. Do you think it's changed? If not, we're way back with the boys. Long it, ago. I would say that there is a segment of black males, that that is their reality, that he says two, in essence, warring ideals in one dogged body <clears throat> that is almost like tearing them apart. And one of the reasons why is I believe it is black rage. And I have black rage. I had it since the day I watched that Olympics and saw Tommy Smith and Johnny Carlos take the winner's podium and put their fist up, bow their head, giving the black power salute while the national anthem was being played. And that was a shot that was fired around the world. At that day, I had black rage at 14 years old and tears streamed down my face and something said something is wrong with this country. And I started eating black books and black uh, uh, history and knowledge and so forth. But I have now grown over the years that I have black rage creatively. 
And I believe that when a brother does not have black rage creatively, then it will be those two strivings that go on within a body of how he is treated in America and being a black man, knowing his abilities and potentials and, and, and being interrupted and inhibited to fully express them. Okay. Thank you. And my last question deals with the veil. And I'm going to read a little passage from the souls of black folk. <clears throat> this is Du Bois talking. I secured the school. He was looking for a job. And he had gone to, and I think he's in Tennessee at this point, and he's moving on and he's looking for a new job. <clears throat> I, secure, I secured the school. I remember the day I rode horseback out to the commissioner's house with a pleasant young white fellow who wanted the white school. The road ran down the bed of a stream. The sun laughed and the water jingled. And we rode on. What passage? I just couldn't yeah. get over that. Yes. Come in, said the commissioner. Come in. Have a seat. How much do you want? Meaning what salary? Oh, I thought, and Du Bois talking, this is lucky. But even then <clears throat> fell the awful shatter of the veil. For they ate first, and then I alone. Mm. He was not included, right? That's right. It was the same old, same old kind of thing. What do you think about the veil? Is that still going on? Not only is there a veil, there are walls that are being constructed, literal walls called gentrification. There are literal walls that are being constructed in this country called book banning and seeking to take away black history out of schools. Veils are, <laughs> are passe now. There are walls that are intentionally being constructed that we see every day. And that is something that we must address, <laughs> must deal with. But I do totally concur with the ancestor and eminent Dr. Derek Bell, who I have his books, you know, and we are not saved, faces at the bottom of the well, and so far I've read them all. But he said, he talks about the permanence of racism. But we must still fight against it. So we have to fight against those walls. We have to fight against the veils. They are still here and they are being constructed, literally, legislatively, metaphorically, relationally. Hmm. They're still here. And it seems as though that's what Brian Flores is doing with this lawsuit. John Salati, we'd like to get you in before we wrap up. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Minister Vanderhorst, for what you're doing. I mean, we talk about injustice on this program, and well, we don't even have to, you know, get into it. You've laid it out for us right here, so uh, that is totally right, spot on with what uh, the Legal Zone is is about week after week. And um, I thank you for that. Um, Dr. Cheney has focused a little bit on some things coming out of the past that still resonate all too much in our daily lives. I'm going to go and touch on some things that you opened with and this idea of um, taking it back. And I think we would all benefit from hearing a little more about that. That is 
if you have a 12 year old black male you're working with, what does that look like for him? How do you, how do you work with him on that? What does that mean for him? Well, in our organization, Prepare Our Youth, we have um, a model. See, my thing is, uh, well, Dr. Naeem Akbar said that white modalities were made for white people. Many times um, there are some black entities that seek to use white modalities for black people, even though they were not constructed with them. One of the premises I think about often is who decides and who decides who decides. If I was not included in the decision-making process, it's already been decided for me and all I'm expected to do is conform. And if I don't, then I'm penalized. So we made our decision that we are going to decide on what modalities we will use and those modalities we would have to create. And so we created a modality called a spirit-centered modality. We are tripartite as individuals. We have a spirit, we have a mind, and we have a body. And we know that one entity impacts all. You know, we've heard in the medical field, psychosomatic illnesses, what impact the the minds of some people affects their physical health, you see. So when some young person comes into our program, basically, we first, here it is, all of nature functions from center to circumference from the inside out. So it's the very principle within the seed that when it breaks out, we get the blade of grass or the ear of corn. So our modality follows nature. So we start with the center. We go to that spirit, that human spirit. So say for instance, there's a young person. We have to ascertain the degree of interruption in their human spirit. Were they weighted? That's based on burdens and pressures as we call it. Were they wounded? A wounded spirit comes through words, dehumanized, cussed out. Were they oppressed, different abuses, physically, molestation, whatever? Were they violated? So we first have to ascertain the degree of their spirit. Were they weighted, wounded, oppressed, or violated? What went on? What were the encounters, the experiences, and so forth? Once we ascertain and begin to address that interrupted spirit, then we have to come out to that soul part of the person. That's where their mind, their emotions, and their will, their decision-making process functions from. So how did that interrupt the spirit, let's say of uh, uh, physical abuse, affect how he thinks, how he feels, and what he does? And then we have to see how the body became the servant and carries it, carried it out. Maybe he starts self-medicating off of smoking weed. So our process is very thorough as we seek to see how that individual has been impacted in spirit, mind, emotions, their decisions, and in body so that we can do the best we can in assisting them in becoming whole. And to us, wholeness is brokenness repaired, not perfection. I can see that. I can see that. Um, all right, so, and then there's that sort of thing play out. You talked about decolonizing black parenting. So again, helping us all to understand more concretely what that looks like. Uh, again, what is being decolonized? Because I'll say the things that you kind of laid out, I'm thinking, well, that sounds like a good idea for anybody to do. So there must be something particular about what you're laying out that plays out to that concept of decolonizing Black parenting. 
Thank you for that question. Um, let me put this foundationally, is that it is my belief and practice that we must have a profound respect for the humanity of all people, regardless of how they self-identify. So I wanna say that foundationally, because truth is not against people, you see. And being pro-black doesn't mean anti-white. I just center in who I am, my ancestry, my culture, and so forth. That's where my worldview comes from, not from someone else's, basically, you see. So when you say that many of those principles can impact all people, I agree with you because they are for humanity, you see. But for black parenting, when my ancestors came off of ships named Jesus and the grace of God in shackles and manacles into this country, there was a total paradigm shift as it pertained to black parenting. That they did not have control over their children. They could be sold. They watched them get whipped. That's why we even see, when you read Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGruy, she talks about those transgenerational adaptations from slavery. Where we see a lot of black mothers who will protect their sons. It didn't just start now. It's like, we don't want you taken away from us off this plantation. We don't know what will happen to you. If you say this, if you look in the eyes of a white slave holder, not master, slave holder, you can get whipped, you can get killed. What I'm saying is the whole paradigm of black, African black parenting shifted and moved into a whole colonization format. And so the hittings, so now you see a black parent who will in, in front of the slaveholder start beating their child, hopefully to keep the slaveholder or the overseer from beating the child. We see a lot of interesting dynamics and behaviors that are taking on, taken on and then one day when emancipation comes, but as one brother said, emancipation is a proclamation, but not a fact. Once that came into being, now they say, okay, you go out, be a man, be a husband, be a wife, be a mother. But we see some of black parenting that poses as a de facto protege of white slaveholders and the slaveholders' wives in the big house and the mistreatments and the way they speak to the to their black the, the black individuals and so forth. There's so much that needs to be decolonized dealing with black parenting. Mm. One more thing then. Okay, thank you for that. That helps unpack that concept. I'm sure we could have spent an hour or more just on that. Oh, yeah, we could. <laughs> uh, so there was a lot there and, and that was good. One last thing. I know he's so humble. He's probably not going to bring this up. You mentioned earlier that one of the um, strategies you use is um, books, you know, mentoring with books. And I could not help but thinking of uh, Mr. Phillips' uh, book, the Adventures of Uncle Billy and Rocks, where there is a book that talks about a young black man, I think he's 12, 13 years old, and how he uh, is working with his uncle back and forth to learn life lessons and learning from this person. And I, I, I guess it's not so much a question, I commend it to you for your work there as part of uh, mentoring through books, because it is an excellent book. I've had a chance to read it many times and uh, can say it is uh, 
it touches on these very concepts that you you laid out so well here. Wow. And that and that was the intent of writing the book, just as Minister Van Hoor said, is to tutor young black men to that the book he's referring to is a book called um, The Adventures of Uncle Billy and Ross, Life Lessons Made Simple. And in the book, Uncle Billy is teaching Ross life lessons that a lot of us didn't get growing up. Lessons taught by um, Napoleon Hill, the Bible, Shakespeare, these things that we don't hear, but he's speaking to him in such a way that he would understand. So it's, it's out now. But how can what you're doing is so powerful and so great? How can people get in contact with Prepare Our Youth and you? Um, through my website, prepareouryouth.org. Okay. Prepareouryouth.org. If they come on our website, they can actually see what we're doing. Um, our contact information is there. Okay. And our producer will make sure and put that down. And if anyone watching, you're not subscribed yet, hit on the red button, subscribe, hit on the bell. And every week we have a broadcast, it would alert you. This entire month is Black History Month. And we kicked it off with Minister Kwame Ronnie Vanderhorst. And wow, what a powerful kickoff that was. Thank you so much, Minister Vanderhorst, from for coming on today and educating us on the souls of Black men. It's, it, it's my honor and responsibility. Thank you. Dr. Cheney, thank you for those powerful questions in the reading from W.E. Du Bois' book, The Souls of Black Folks. Mm -hmm. Brother Salati, thank you again so much for being here. Always a pleasure, Salon. Always a pleasure to be with you. All right. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. And we'll see you all next week where we have another broadcast specializing or focusing on African-American history. Take care. Thanks for watching our video. For experienced legal services in Washington, D.C., Alabama, and Washington State, visit our website at remuslaw.com or call us at 1-833-329-1799. Lessons taught in the adventures of Uncle Billy and Ross are lessons that adults learn late in life. Some never learn it. I will recommend every parent, every young person, every adult, read this book. But more importantly, apply the lessons.